Okay. All right, here we go. We're we're fantastic. Welcome to the Paracast. I'm your host, Tomas the Boss Fernandez. That's right. We're back. It's another week. Things are great. Everything's great for everybody all the time. Nothing bad ever happens to anybody. Ever. Uh, ever. Joining me tonight, he took last place in the ugly contest. It's Steve Koski. Last place in ugly means first place in beautiful. Wait. Wait, that could be true. It could be true. It depends on your competitors. He took first place at the Ugly Contest. It's Robert Wyatt. <laughs> I'm a winner! With a Hawaiian I'm, shirt on. Yeah, and my Hawaiian shirt has a picture of my cat on it, because that's like a late Christmas present for me. I was really quite impressed by that. That's actually your cat? That's my cat. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Bougie. Um, yeah, Punch. I, Custom shirts. Remember, like in the custom shirts in like the 1990s, it was like one of the biggest deals ever. You know, a t shirt manufacturer, you got a custom shirt that says, I'm with stupid. Oh my God. This is, freaking, <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, he only needs two things to survive a Niners win and 40 brass. He's getting neither. It's Kenny Terry. I mean, it's very true. Very true. That was a frustrating game. I, I'm happy. I'm happy. I, uh, so I, I was a big Padres fan for a long time. And like, Finally, like, gave up, just stopped following baseball for a while. Then this year they went to the National League Championship, you know, and lost promptly to the Philadelphia Phillies. And uh, I was like, okay, good. Good. It's the same way I feel about the OV one show. I was like, thank God it sucks. So that way it can be dead to me and I don't have to pay attention to it ever again. <laughs> Star Wars is dead. Everything's dead. Moving on with my life. That's that's what I like. That's, that's, that's the name of the game. Just destroy everything you ever once used to love. It, it's the only way to make yourself stronger. Stronger, mm -hmm. wider, mm -hmm. emotionally more stable. Have have less things you care about. Anyways, um, while well, we're here, we're all having fun. Uh, went out, did a quick little range session yesterday with the old uh, appendix carry thing. And uh, uh, how you doing with it? Uh, it's it's consistently a second at like ten yards. Good. So I can do a second and a hit at ten yards. Um, I was messing around with uh, Jared, and so the game was. Who can get two shots off? How fast can somebody draw and get two shots off? Jared had an outside the waistband T Rex arms holster with his his uh oh I I almost wish we just just had him on because he 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 bought a um he got a what is it staccato what's the compensated one the SC XC I think XC XC yeah so he has the XC right and it's it's a compensated gun and he got such a deal on it because the previous owner took a Dremel tool to the rear serrations on one side because they were bugging his thumb. So uh, wow. yeah, so it looks ugly wow. as sin. So he was shooting one of those a compensated nine millimeter pistol out of a race holster, and so he was like drawing and putting two shots on the target at like one, and sometimes like one o three or one o six. So pretty quick, and so I got two tenths of a second. I was able to do it, but um, within within the two tenths, I wasn't that fast with two shots. But it was nice. I did get a couple eights from appendix at five yards. What? Yeah. Like a, like an eight O's or eight fives, eight, eight six, sixes, eight seven. Power factor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the power factor, right now, sure, Alex. Every time I go out, I always have the the chrono in the back and the uh, and the um, the uh, tripod, and you just go out there and you just chrono and just people shoot the ammo and you know, and it's just like, oh, these this, these bullets are way better. I loaded them way better, and then they shoot it through the chrono, and it's just like. That's mm -hmm. why four hundred feet per moving. second and six hundred feet per second. Like I, we talked about standard deviation, and I don't want to like publicly name Alex and Jared about their ammo, uh, but their standard deviation is <laughs> like sixty, <laughs> eighty feet per second. Uh, the low end was fifty. Jeez. That's what happens when there's some, very little powder in the case. Some, some, <laughs> There was, it's there like was Alex, Alex, sh shake the powder to the back of the case. It helps. It's like it's like sh pump, pump, uh, pump the revolver up in the air like you're trying to raise the roof for a second, get it all to the back of the case, and then you want to fire because it's one of those things that you kind of you like. As nine millimeter loaders, we almost never run into case volume issues with certain powders. But then you get something like thirty eight. You can have it with forty five. You get like these. It's just like oh we're, well, we're just gonna ignite some of the powder. Or there's not enough powder back there. And so, especially these days where we, we can't be too picky about the powder we're, we're suggesting it, it can get there. But yeah, 
gigantic, gigantic is powder, holes. Is powder, sti- is powder still? Um, I know it's. It, I know it's in short demand or short supply, but is it still really hard to find what you want? Well, not it seems for, like for me. It seems like it's getting better, but okay. It's better. It's better for me because I'm a little bit more basic. Like, give me some tight group or some Winchester, and I'm. I'm like I, but I haven't walked around. Like every once in a while, I'll see some unique. I'll see some ramshot silhouette. I don't see the sport pistol too often now. That still seems like that's a little bit harder to come by. But I would imagine that some of these revolver powders are a little bit uh, harder to find. But right, so you can right. get you can get powder and you can get something close to what you want, but maybe not exactly what you want in the size you want every time you walk in the store. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom, I'm curious. You know, back in the old single action gunslinging days, some of the when they'd compete, they'd wear these like steel things. To, so if you shot a, a shot down your leg, it would kind of curve the bullet away from your leg. Away from your leg. Do you uh, do you wear one of those? When, is there a, an appendix carry version of that? Kind of like a nut protector. It, I, I wish. <laughs> what I what I should do is just like cut down the holster and then stick the the muzzle through my fly. Just kind of like pop it, pop it up there, just you just know? lean just lean back and just kind of aim it right. Um, as far as like what I can feel like at speed, like that initial draw doesn't seem to th- that part does not feel like I'm ever getting on the trigger too early because I, I feel like I'm not touching it. I feel like as soon as my hands come together, like when you're trying to go that fast, once the hands come together, you're basically I can kind of see like a. Front I want Jared side of the to shoot some Bam. as high a frame rate as he can get some video next time you're doing that. Yeah, it it would be interesting. So, we just want to see when your finger gets on the trigger. Yeah, so yeah, some I was going to say ones. that's that's why I mean that's why I actually like a double action single action for an appendix. Yeah. Because I've still got a lot of travel before that thing cooks. It off. does make some sense. And this, yeah, the shadow system. Considering what's at stake. Uh huh. The shadow I li- system. Has I like a lot the boys a lot, and I and I'd really like them to stick around for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm pretty good with not getting my finger on the trigger. But me and Jared were kind of like playing around with like how fast we could get stuff done. And I saw Jared uh, not complete a drill, but not complete it in such a spectacular fashion that I have to mention it to you guys. So we were shooting bill drills, and he, he I think out of like the six attempts he did at these bill drills, he maybe shot the six twice. Uh, it's mostly. really hard to shoot six, all right? It's hard to shoot six, but we were we were like trying to like set ourselves up and we were like, we're at five yards. So this is just full, full burn down hose, hoser mode, you know. And Alex had one of his friends. It's like his first time actually going to the range and watching people shoot. And you got me and Step over there trying to do like eight tenths appendix draws. And Jared Step at five yards with his XC shot five shots from the draw in 1.24 seconds. What? Yeah. How many? How, how many? And he got it all alpha? What run? It was like his second run. Damn! It does. Probably, that boy can split the crap out of the tree. Yeah, he can. Yeah, it he was can. like, you'll have to check my math, but I remember two things very specifically, which was a 7-0 draw and I think three twelves and a 15, something like that. Ooh. It was... I just... It I was, just like watching him shoot because, I mean, he'll run that gun... He'll run those guns faster than like an automatic... It just runs so fast sometimes. Yeah, I mean, just to show like how much faster he splits the trigger than I do. My fastest build drills are 150, and I smoked him on the draw. Wow, <laughs> that's how much. But I actually shot six shots. But just how much faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was probably looking at like if he if he managed to land it, probably like a 136 for uh, a five yard build drill. But it was one of those things because what we had done is like we were drawing and shooting and drawing and shooting, and then it was just like, all right, well, I'm gonna set the part time for seven tenths. And then we did like 10 practice dry draws and just beep, bring it up, click, beep, click. We do that 10 times and then you go load the gun and then you load the gun and then you go beep and then you just watch everyone just kind of land a, a pretty close to what would be a 710 straw or something like that around there. But yeah, it's just like the second attempt we did at doing these build drills and he just whips it out and just bah, 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 bah. like I can't even I can't even mimic it as fast as he did it on that thing. And it was pretty it was pretty, pretty nuts. So, that's had, awesome. No video, no video on no, that one. No I'm video on that one. No video on that one. But you know, maybe one day. I did get some videos on Instagram of uh, some of the draws that are going on. So, but it was funny. It was like it was cold, and then it got warm, 
And then, like, when it got warm, I was able to consistently be well under a second. And then it started getting cold down when I filmed it, and it was like a second, 9.6, 103. But it's getting better. So I'm, I'm having where, fun. Where was it? So, at? what you're saying is we need to bring a chrono to the next match, Alex and Jared shoot? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that is, that is a good point. I mean, was the bullets that Jared's shooting, did they make power factor? Well, here's the here's the things with those damn <laughs> That's staccatos. Why he shot all these. I, yeah, I was gonna say because I mean I can shoot I can shoot twenty twos pretty quick. Listen, if I was him, I would shoot up all that non power factor ammo as quick as he can because I know neither one of those guys wants to pull the bullets that they've made. They're just gonna try yeah. to try to shoot them. But the one thing is like messing around with that staccato, that XC was that the those things are like toys. Their slides are like airsoft guns. Like right. it, it has like a seven pound recoil spring. And so it's like, it's just this little little play thing that you mess around with. And then it has kind of the, that JP5 rifle feeling where under the gold dots or like a full load, like the gun is just driving itself down. So you're shooting it and the recoils progressively, you're just watching the dot drive itself down. Hmm. It's one of the... What? There's, there's no recoil. It has a seven pound recoil spring in it. It's... it's, in, it's uh, it, integrally comped well it has a comp built into it and so it's just literally driving itself lower and lower and lower and lower and lower as you're trying to split it and so like so jared's jared's shots would be like would just be like like imagine like drawing that's that, a, a drawing that's actually, a Z with your finger you're just like you start from the top you go down you go across and you go down across again and it's just like that's what the recoil pattern is on that thing that's that's weird because i mean that's that's so unlike how most cops shoot where they usually shoot at the ground and then they just kind of like zipper it up oh i, I mean I, but now he's like going top down that's just that's <laughs> i mean that's just a game changer for cops. does the comp even work with three grains of powder <laughs> <laughs> At, at at that point, it's just called a bear away. Believe me, there was plenty of shots that ended up low on the target on the on the speed zone when we were when we were going out there. But it's nice every once in a while to go see what you can do. So, speaking of seeing what you can, Kenneth, let's actually hear about a pistol match. Yeah, so it was really weird. I decided to shoot a pistol match. <clears throat> I wasn't sure how to do it again, so I went to the new shooters briefing. They told me what to do safely. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that might want to attend that. Was that the remedial training session? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. When you see a target, like here, here is fire. Don't fire here. <laughs> That's how it works? Yeah, surprisingly. I thought we we're supposed to put the berm. I did too, but shocker of all shockers, people kind of frown on that. No, so I went to Logan. It was our first matchup in Logan of the year. And uh, they, were, they were a good stage. There was two stages that uh, – I thought were pretty interesting. They were questionably legal or not, but there was the very risky way of shooting them, which if you went the risky way, you were only gaining 7% or so. Or That's then you could like lay up and shoot the easy way. Yeah. And I figured, you know, what, well, the why risky not? Way. Let's see what's right. going to happen here. It's Kenny Terry we're talking about. Yeah, one went awesome. One went horribly. So we're 50-50 <laughs> we're on it. <laughs> you scratch. So just scratch describe the risk. This. What was the risk? So one stage was, I think it was six targets behind barrels and then a plate rack. And you could shoot it from multiple positions so you could see the entire targets and then plate rack. Or there was like one little spot you could get into that you could see four of the targets. You see about two inches of the target. And so it was all <laughs> you, from one spot. And right. you just shoot a D. Just go for a couple Ds and be exactly. done. Exactly. Yeah, like one of them you were literally shooting the very bottom left. You had about two inches all D. Like no matter what, you were shooting a D. If you didn't shoot a D, you shot through a barrel. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, so doing the math, I was like, well, if you do it correct, it's a little over one hit factor. Did it correct. Wow. The other one was shooting poppers at a super tight angle to drop turners, and that one did not go good. It's like six shots to hit a popper. Oof. Oh. I remember the first time I heard the Waukee brothers gaming something like that, like, oh, you could shoot a couple Ds here. I'm like, you could what? You could, you could, you can do that? Like, <laughs> why would anyone <laughs> want to do that? Well, the funny thing on the one that you can only select two inches of the targets, I was the very last shooter, and so everybody else just shot it, you know, in the conventional multiple positions, and then I just stood in one spot. And, and yeah, I guess nobody else had saw it other than Leo and myself, who were, we were going back and forth on how to shoot it. Leo shot it the more conventional way. And... Oh, because that's a USPSA stage design rule. You can't be, you can't, it, you're not allowed in a long course to be able to shoot everything from one position, right? Not supposed to. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that, that's actually most courses short mediums you, you can't shoot everything from one position not that that stopped him at area three two years ago 
even though I went and asked Troy, hey, this is this is this isn't legal, is it? And he's like, well, everybody's already shot it, so we're just going to keep we're going to yeah. keep it in the match. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm, I don't see where in the rule book where it says when everybody's already shot it, it's OK. Yeah, I well, hate not, that. The stage is really good. And I was actually uh, for not practicing pistol at all since about September of last year. I was pretty happy. I never had a single makeup on steel until that stage. I was shooting them at an angle. And that was also the only stage I lost of the day. So, well done. Wow. I was pretty, I was pretty happy with how well I shot, considering no Absolutely. practice. And Got a fly out of your hand. No, surprising. Yeah. I can still hold 175 power factor on a 40 ounce gun. <laughs> That's impossible. That's <laughs> manly, <laughs> manly man. No, nobody could have fun shooting a sport like that. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. That's why we're all going minor dot heavy guns. Hey, uh, speaking they, of minor dot heavy guns. <laughs> Go ahead, Robert. Well, no, I, I took I took one of my other Shadow Twos, and I was working on it this weekend. And it was funny because uh, I was mentioning this, but like when I would run the slide on this, that it would hang up about halfway through the stroke, and I could not figure out why I was doing it. And I was like, I changed out the springs. I went through. I actually cleaned the gun, which I mean, it, it killed me to clean the gun, but I did it because science. Did you soak it in diesel and then just blow it off with a compressed air? I would have, but I don't have any anymore. I mean, that's what Wyatt taught me to do, and I thought it was. A, I think it's a fantastic way to do it because it works exceptionally well. But no, I I had the thing completely tore apart, and finally I I put it back together. This is so it's this is a it's an optic slide um, that went to an iron sided um, frame, and I was like, well, maybe maybe because I actually had to I had to uh, what do you call it when you like cut the rails. Um, but I had basically had to fit the rails in there and I was thinking maybe that was screwing it up. But in the end, I actually started looking at it really close and on the frame, uh, about halfway through, there was this spot where CZ, when they went and spray painted it with, uh, whatever the paint is that they use that you could see where the paint had actually like rolled down over the side of the frame and created these little blobs. And this stuff's hard. I mean, it's not like Krylon or something like that, but that's, that was what was to it. And so I, took a file to it and I, I got it all worked out and it, sure enough, it just, it goes perfect. But I mean, that was straight from the factory. I can't believe, honestly, I can't believe that nobody ever, um, the people who ever had this before me, that they never noticed that because it was, you want to, when a slide moves, you want that thing to just be nice and consistent all the way back. And this was like clunk, 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 clunk. And so well, huh. maybe, maybe they did notice it and that's why they sold it. It yeah. could be. It could be. Well, that's a great find because it's an easy fix and it's it no harm, easy. no foul, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. So it's it's nice getting that. That's a te testament to like not all finishes are just paint. Like finish, yeah. finishes, finishes yeah. are hardening agents. Yeah. Everybody, there's like melanite. Get that shit stuff off the stuff. Like that's... what do you what do you think this what do you think it is that they use on these things? I mean, I I know it's not Krylon. It's like I know that it's not like a Cerakote. I mean, what do they use on, I mean, on guns likely, for most, their finishes? Most likely it's, I mean, most modern stuff is a, some sort of a melaniting process. And yeah. so melaniting is a hardener. And so what they'll do is they, melaniting and chrome lining. So you used to talk here about like chrome line barrels. And so when, mm -hmm. you, when you press or cut a barrel and force a piece of steel, it always wants to return to kind of like its original state. And so what happens is, is that they, they would, not only for longevity, well, kind of longevity and uh, corrosion resistance, is that they would form those riflings with chrome, and that chrome would lock in, and it would actually brace the barrel to maintain its shape. And what that also does is that hardens it so that um, when you shoot a bunch of it, like that steel has a hardener on it. And so the imperfections that were locked into the barrel, imperfections in the barrel would be locked in by the hardening. And so now they use a melanite, and that melanite just helps um, – keep that barrel so corrosion resistance but also it helps it keep it formed and held solid uh in its in its state and so that's what basically everyone's going like uh you know glock had the tenifer finish now they use like a pervade what's their what's their their nomenclature now like a pervasive hostile environment finish kind of like what hk <laughs> uses it's just a melaniting but like it, that's when like when you saw that process like guns like the smith and wesson m ps the one thing you'll notice about your M&Ps is like they'll never look like they have a bunch of finish problems or uh, holster wear because they that melaniting is freaking legitimate and that shit ain't moving. 
So. Well, I know on like this CZ, it's it to me, it's actually really unusual to look at this CZ because I'm so used to like this whole part on both sides of the gun. Uh, just completely being, shiny. Oh, yeah, 100%. And so like it's weird to actually have a, have a Shadow 2 that isn't shiny like that. And so I, I don't know. I mean, if it's melanite, that's fine. But um, it it certainly rubs off over over time with all that holster wear. So. I mean, I guess, Steve, you were saying the chrome is kind of the way to go if you want something that's just going to be long-lasting. Well, that was the cool thing back in the day. I haven't known anyone that's hard chromed a gun for a while. Yeah, outside of uh, Kenny Kenny Platt. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And then he cracked it, which sucks. <laughs> and it cracked three weeks later. Yeah, that, that, that hurts you in the feels. But, no, it was, it was nice. I mean, I, it makes me happy because, I mean, it just... The gun, it's like you expect the gun to do a certain thing when it's not. You just you sit there and you just start you just start dorking with it. And since in this case my thumb, I knew my thumbs weren't getting in the way. Um, it it was nice to actually just be able to actually fix it and move on. So I did that, and then I I replaced the disconnector on it, so it's got a, a much better double action. Now I think I'll I'll probably shoot shoot this thing for a little while, and just kind of see how it goes. The only thing I don't like about it is it's got. Um, it came with it, and I just haven't gotten around to changing it. But it has Cajun's race hammer, which uh, and that's works. not allowed. It that's not allowed in your division. Oh no, it's it's totally <laughs> allowed, unfortunately. But um, I just don't like it. I I just don't think it aesthetically looks good because it leaves. I don't know if you can see it in the video, but it leaves a gap between the slide and the hammer, and I really dislike that. I just, I've just purely aesthetics. Uh, CZ Custom sells it. It's the the wide the wide hammer that goes to the, to this gun, and I just think it looks better. Stupid, right? It's, but it's oh, yeah. purely aesthetic. But I just I like the way it looks. Looks like eighty percent of the game, Robert. That's right. Yeah, it, yeah, that's it is. It is for me. That's for sure. Well, yeah, that, uh, it is. I mean, like Instagram, it's all about splitting triggers and missing stuff and sending shots over the berm as long as you got the right kit on your belt. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the CZ Shadow says it's a nitride uh, finish. A nitride finish. A nitride finish, so it's nitrided. So I'm not sure if nitride – I don't think nitride is as hard as a melanite or if it's just another street name huh. for a melaniting process. But Well, my five-year-old Shadow 2s, um, they definitely – they look like they've been used. Um, they're they're, and Good. that's great. I I I like that about them. I like that means I you like had them. a lot of fun with them. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, unlike, unlike the Berettas, where you took them in and out of the holster seventeen times, and all of a sudden they look like they've been through uh, World War Three, with <laughs> with a guy who had no legs and had to use it as a cane. The thing is so funny is finish. when the armory was doing a lot of like Cerakote jobs, you people would come in, they'd pay like three hundred and fifty, four hundred bucks to get the battle worn look on their gun, and it's like, bro. I have a truck. I'll just drag it behind it for two or three miles. It'll be the same, and I'll save you money. Well, the one thing is, like, take Cerakote in and out of a holster six times. There you go. There's your battle-worn look. Like, it right. Just, it just, just carry that gun around. It's pink. Yeah. It's pink. Yeah, I don't I don't get it. I mean, people, obviously, people do whatever makes them happy. I have no issues if you own a Cerakote or paint a gun. It was just, that one, that one was always weird to me. Why you would pay that much money to make your gun look like it would look if you just shot it. The, the only time I paid for a Cerakote was because it was seven weeks faster than getting the same gun nitrided. I was like, yeah, just get it back to me. Was that What's Cerakote? the process that... I'm feeling uh, attacked right now because I'm getting gun Cerakoted right now. No, I don't No, I don't have a problem with Cerakoting <laughs> a gun. I really don't. I, I mean, I Cerakoted Mercedes' uh, little pink rifle because that's just what she wanted. And, and that's totally... It's only the battle-worn one that just doesn't it, make sense to me. It's that, that's it's, where it's just... It's I don't bad on... It pistols like on a rifle yeah. it looks kind of cool and then other rifles are fine but like anything that where like a rifle does sits in a bag or sits on a sling or sits on a bipod or something like that but like a, a gun that's in and out of the holster just just trashes it trashes the looks yeah i gotta i gotta hear about the uh uh hold on i wish i had some theme music we could play glock performance trigger update steve go i have a shipping notice I have no triggers. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is a big letdown. <laughs> sorry. I was, I was actually like, wait, really? Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, every day I go out to the, 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 the mailbox, and I'm like, <gasps> <sighs> oh, it's so no. depressing. 
no. Those bastards. That's the thing. I, I, I really hate that now where we have this we have this uh, shipping notice system where it'll send you an email saying um, that, hey, your product is shipped. But all it really means is that they printed the they label printed out. The label. Yes. They created yeah. The label. yeah. It's like they're thinking about shipping something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like it could sit on the shelf for another two weeks, but we shipped it. Oh, we, I, I get that all the time. Uh, uh, sir, I ordered my thing next day air, and uh, they shipped it yesterday, and it's not here. And then I'm just like, the first question I always ask, it's like the IT people, you know, it's like, uh, did you turn it on and off? My first question is, <laughs> is, it, is it from UPS? Seventy percent of the time they go, yeah, here it is, and it says USPS. USPS. Like, Ma'am, that's the United States Post Office. We are a different entity altogether. Have a nice day, God bless. I drive off, and then the other one is the other one is all right. Well, let's pull it up on your phone, and then it's the uh, label created, and then yeah. it's like they have, yeah. yeah. ma'am, that label is in a box in a warehouse, but don't worry, that box has your name on it, and I'm pretty sure that they'll get around to doing that, and once they give it to us. You got a damn guarantee we're gonna get it there by the by the next day. Until then, thank you, God bless. I drive off. Mm. <laughs> the label created. Although uh, Tommy, with the way the way you are right now and all that snow up there, technically you'd say God bless and then ski off. Ski or off, snowshoe just... off. <laughs> <laughs> Down the hill. <laughs> I, they helicopter you, know, you in with a pack full the, of package, full the, of boxes. The worst thing you can do for your body is work at a ski resort. Because uh, it's funny, because at the ski resort, they underpay everybody there because everyone there gets free ski passes. So they're like, oh, wait, how much are we working for? $12 an hour? Thank God. I get to ski. <laughs> and I, I literally walked into one of the employees and I'm like, I haven't seen you a bit. They're like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, what happened? It's like, I shattered my arm. I was like, how'd you skiing? Yeah. Here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm really behind on school. Why are you behind? You got school? any health coverage with this job? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just like they're like three weeks back in school from the surgery of taking the titanium plate and uh, screwing it into their arm. You know, fun stuff, fun stuff. Anyways, so no Glock performance triggers yet. You you should be excited. I almost bought a Timney. I will wait till your review on the Glock performance trigger because everyone who tells me. This is this is the rule. Anyone who tells me when I start thinking about grabbing a Timmy is like they break, they don't work. Then Kenny Terry says mine works fine. Kenny but, Terry doesn't shoot it enough to actually have an opinion. <laughs> I mean that's true. It only has like four thousand rounds on it right now. Of from me, I don't know how many Mark put on it, but I've only put about four thousand on it. And mm -hmm. it works. It, so maybe they have it all figured out. Maybe they have. And it all that, figured. We'll God, see. that's the thing. Is like I I have I've actually heard that they took. Because Timmy is actually super good about listening to the field reports, and they they fix their stuff. But what I what I understand is what they don't do is put out you know Timmy triggers Glock edition version 2.0, and so you don't know if you've got version one or version two kind yeah. of thing. They just quietly fix the stuff and move on. Well, and, and so maybe it's going to work. Maybe Kenny has the better versions that just did work. But man, I know a lot of people who have had those things fail in the worst time that ever could happen. Well, the other thing I, I'm trying to figure out is if it's a Gen 5 problem or a Gen a Gen 3 through 4 problem that they're experiencing. So, yeah, I'm a Gen sure. 4, but I don't. Yeah, that's and that's what I would that's what I would get. The five. problem with that though like there's so many products that fail that isn't necessarily the product's fault though. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <clears throat> no, you're you're yeah, I, I Definitely 100%. You see that all the time. People, I mean, like with gallon bullets, people would call up and be like, hey, there's something wrong with your bullets. Oh, I'm sorry about yeah. that. Tell me what's happened. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to load it. Okay, well, did you did you bell the case? What's that? Yeah. I thought well, I shit. Just, I thought I just, it goes from uh, resize right into bullets. I eating. just picked it up off the ground, and I scooped some powder into it, and then I hammered it in there really good. <laughs> yeah, it's like when people talk about their reloads, and it's like, and it's got like a lead around the edge after I get done. It's like, okay, there's a bad sign. But when I take yeah. it back, the, the around the rim's fine. It's like, yeah, it's, you're shaving the bottom of the bullet off when you're mm -hmm. going in there. Yep. And so, fun. Fun, Sometimes everybody. Have uh, anyway, head on over to Dominate Defense. I'm wearing the shirt. I'm a company man. Uh, Steve, sorry. Steve, Steve, raise his hand. Steve, go ahead. Oh, I was going to uh, tell a little story about the party tell the on story. February 11th. Tell so the story. Utah Defensive Pistol League is a, they were originally an IDPA shooting club that 
me and a couple of guys founded back in 1997. And they've been around, they've been shooting out at the farm for what, 10, 12, Long maybe since two th- around 2000, 2001. Where did you, where did you guys shoot before that? Oh, we shot a lot of places. We shot a few matches just out on BLM land. We shot at the Thistle Sheriff's Range. Really? We shot in Hovel Creek Canyon at that range. We shot in Pleasant Grove at Pat Zakar at like the Elks Club basement or something like that, where they have steel up about four feet and you can put all the targets down low. We shot in somebody's backyard. Yeah. <laughs> like that's where that's going. <laughs> we, sh- we shot down on the other side of the Thistle Range, just into the, you know, at a safe, safe area. But I mean, we've had matches a lot of different places, but that's the crazy. farm by far the longest. And so the club as of late is just, I, I don't, I haven't been a club officer for some time, so I'm guessing on some of this, but we've, it sounds like they've had some kind of troubles getting new people to come in and take the reins and set up stages and like Carrie Palmer and Jen Jolly have been, and other people have been real workhorses for a long time. And they're kind of tired of being (laughs) doing 90, doing 99% of the work. And, and what they haven't, we haven't got new people to step up. And so there's no matches on the schedule this year, or there's just a couple that actually aren't being run by UDPL. They're being run by the range kind of through UDPL. So anyway, I was telling my daughter about this and how like part of me wants to like go back and like be the club president again and like do all these things. But I know like I'm not the best, I'm not a great leader in that respect. And I don't, that's kind of a, I've done, I've done that and I've kind of done the burnout thing. So I, that's probably not a good, good, not a good move for the club or for me. And, and I was telling her like, Oh, that's kind of a bummer. And, but like all the good times she's had and she's like, well, whatever, whatever happens, don't let it go down without a party, like have a party. Yeah. And I was like, that is a very good idea. So there's a party on February 11th, four o'clock, my house, pizza, soda, beer, um, please come. Please. If you've shot a match out there and you want to come, please come. And please unload the guns before we show everyone our own firearms in Steve's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a gun show. It's a party. <laughs> Shots to the weather. That is awesome. I shall, I shall be there in attendance. Yeah, I've I, never I, shot a match there. Am I still invited, Steve? Of course. I'm, I'm persona non grata at that club, so um, I'll send Lex. Yes. <laughs> Or Andrea, send your wife. Yeah, <laughs> send everyone in an iPad with you on a on a link. Uh, so that, that way we can put it face down on the couch if we if we no longer want it. Anyway, uh, dominate defense. Head on over there. Uh, use promo code P A R A one zero. Save ten percent off of a concealed carry belt, a duty belt, or a Mach one speed belt. The finest belts in the industry. That's what I've been rocking. Uh, especially with the appendix rig all the time. So check it out, uh, dominatedefense.com. You can also check out Precision Holsters. Check out their fast holster. Also use uh, pro and their magazine pouches, which are fantastic for IDPA or USPSA. And use promo code PARA10. Save 10% off Rune Tactical. Get, it, get an extra bullet. One more bullet. Save yourself the trouble. It's 11 bucks. Don't be poor. Don't be poor. Match saver. Match, mm-hmm. It's literally the match saver. Buy one. Have it set up. You'll be good to go. Check them out. Rune Tactical. Same same thing. PARA10. Save 10% off Telegram. Questions. Maybe answers. Go. Questionable questionable answers. Questionable, is best. questionable answers. <laughs> Not legal advice. From Kevin Isaac, give us all some legal advice on pistol braces. Uh, sit and wait. I would, uh, I, I, the. Go ahead. I mean, the Second Amendment, you know, it, it seems pretty clear right there. I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't see there any stuttering in the Second Amendment. So, I don't, I don't see why you should comply at all. I know gun owners of America hopped on it. I wonder if they will get a, um, they'll get a judge to put a stay on it till further review or something like that. But it, it seems like that's going to be the play. So, uh, the one thing I. <clears throat> The one thing I'd recommend people not do is send pictures of their firearms to the ATF. Why? Uh, because the ATF is not good with incri- – don't never self-incriminate yourself ever. Yeah, y- ever, yeah. so that ever. actually – they actually talked about that, um, and they cannot – they cannot incriminate you for sending those pictures. 
Um, there's a there's a big thing about that. There's actually there's actually I think it's even a Supreme Court case that says if you go and send them send send the government information uh, in order to comply, and then they come back and say they say you will we're not going to allow this or whatever, they can't then use that against you. And so that so there's there's very good case precedent. Now, having said that, is that going to stop the ATF, who arguably nah. is the most corrupt organization ever created? And I know I realize I say in that because the government's the most corrupt organization ever created. But second to the government, the ATF, well, they the, all suck. The thing is, too, it's like there there's lots of other uh, court standings that simply say that people cannot do things and then people go do things and then they wait for your own little. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's that. You look. I mean, that's happened in government ever since forever. You know, like most re like Biden's like, well, we're just going to extend the the student loan forgiveness uh, thing into this time. The court's like, you can't do it. And he's like, well, so. I mean, government government it happens left, right, and center. They all do it. But just saying, there is a precedence that says that they can't actually hold you. There was also that they also had talked about these uh, these guns that came in, like the this AP five that came in as a certain thing. They and as people were saying. Yeah, and they say that you, there's no way you could register it, and uh, they were actually wrong about that. So there, there's been a whole lot of like hullabaloo going on back and forth about you know what this what this ATF ruling actually says and what it doesn't say. Things that comply. There was uh, for a short period of time, the ATF on their Form One website said that if uh, Steve and I, if I had a, a Form One a short barrel rifle and we we're at the range together and I handed it to him. Um, that would be uh, it would be a violation of the of the the NFA because he he couldn't hold that thing. And the ATF came back very quickly and like, uh, yeah, that was a screw up and we're going to fix that. Uh, fundamentally, legal advice on what you should do as far as the pistol braces. Um, you have options, obviously. And but I heard somebody made made this comment. and I think it's probably pretty valid. Now, this is the. The rule is going to go into effect on the 31st of January, which means that you have 120 days uh, to before it actually becomes official. And in that time frame, you can then register the firearm. The problem is uh, on the 31st, you're going to see all the lawsuits that get dropped. And I have a feeling, and I don't know because I'm really bad at like predicting all this stuff, but I have a feeling you're going to see a handful of these lawsuits start to beat on the ATF's rulemaking because it's really sketchy. And West Virginia v. EPA already said that they can't do what they're doing. They just they lost in regulatory in industries cannot make law. Yeah, um, and then you have the rule of lenity, and that that one alone uh, kind of comes into play because the ATF has spent years saying that a pistol brace is legal only to now come back and say, surprise, we know you guys spent all this money on it. It's now not. But the well, advice that I heard was if you're thinking about taking advantage of the quote unquote free tax stamp, which I think you're an idiot for doing, but if you decide that's what you're going to do, wait, just, I mean, if, if, if it goes through and it's all, and this is going to pass or whatever, and um, wait until, you know, day 115 and then do your form one because, because at that point, all the lawsuits will have been filed and the likelihood of an injunction may or may not have passed. But at that point, you can at least put the, you can put the, uh, you can put the form one in and move forward from there. So like the other thing too, is there's a bunch of these, uh, rifles that were imported as pistols, right? Well, pistols that were imported as pistols and to make yeah. them SBRs like that MP5 you would need to throw in a bunch of parts in it that were US made to even make it an SB uh, an SBR. Yeah, and that that's not that's not a factor in this case. Okay. There uh what was it Fudbusters talked about Fudbusters talked about that and Washington Gun Law talked about that as well. And so and they're both um they're both legal minds so I I think I think your best bet is probably to wait yep. and just see how things shake out. And if you do that, you're at least going to be making a decision that has a little bit more fact and information behind it yep. than just kind of like going but, crazy. That's my thought. Well, like anything, you have to wait till someone's affected. So you have to wait for a lot to go into effect before anyone can actually have um, standing to, to go against it. So yeah, we'll see what happens. 
But pay uh, attention, right? Don't fall asleep at the trigger. Hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. You. You really want to. You really want to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, otherwise, you're going to play the game like some of us do, and you just don't tell the government. Because fundamentally, if you want to have a short barrel rifle and you don't tell anybody about it, then you don't have a problem. There's, there's nothing anyone can sit there and do about it. Just. Uh, and where would people pay attention to that? Boy, there's a lot. Of, by this issue. There's a lot of great uh, YouTube channels. Uh, two that I like a lot is uh, Fud Busters. If they have a YouTube legal. channel. Uh, legally armed. The Washington Gun Law uh, is a guy up in Washington State who puts out content like every single day. They're all really solid, good. The Washington Gun Law, I like him and Fudbusters. I like the best because they kind of try not to get into the, I don't know, what you call it, like the hair on fire effect. And they're like, we're going to tell you the law, and we're going to, and we're not going to tell you what to think. We're going to tell you, you know, here's how right. to think. They're not a bunch of drama queens. Yeah. I definitely, definitely, definitely stay away from uh, the people like Guns and Gadgets and um, Iraq Veteran 88. It, they have good information, but I, they're going to they're gonna come out with stuff just like right on the bleeding edge, and it may or may not be the most accurate. And that's fine. We, we all kind of like say the wrong things from here and there. But I would, you know, generally speaking, if you, if you can wait for two or three days after some new thing comes out, you're probably going to get the... Um, the more calm and rational approach. And that's actually what happened with the GOA thing, where the GOA said uh, that this thing was going to happen where you couldn't register these guns. And then everybody comes back and like, uh, no, that's actually not the case. And the Fudbuster uh, YouTube channel, they actually went through and they're like, look, here's all the case law that says this can't be the case. Can't be the case. It's not it's not correct. And then uh, Jared's Gungeon Gadget, who is really good about putting out some good content like quickly. A, uh, he came back lawyer, and he kind of fixed it. He's a lawyer with GOA, isn't he? No, no, he's he's a former he's a former cop, and no, um, no, no, what am I thinking? I don't know who the, I don't know who the GOA guy is, but um, the long and short of it is just you know keep your keep your eyes eyes and ears open, pay attention to what's going on, and I mean I have a strong feeling I'll keep talking about it because honestly that's the only thing I that's literally the only thing I ever vote on, so. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's my thoughts on the matter. Cool. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, I was thinking, ahead, about, Tommy. I was thinking about Arm Scholar. Oh, that's a good channel too. Yeah, that's a, that's a solid, sorry about that, Arm Scholar. All right, yeah. next question. Uh, from Alex Mansfield, uh, what do you think will come out of the in-person board meeting? Fill us in. I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're, they met. They met uh, yesterday and today. And what was the agenda? So the agenda was talking. I mean, talking about the rule changes, uh, the potential uh, division with limited optics, uh, production, whether production should be uh, high, like full up the mags or yeah. 15 rounds, whatever. I haven't heard yet, and so I'm. I I don't know. I'd I'd like to I'd like to say I'd like to see that production goes full cap. But um, I think that would actually change the game kind of in a fun way. But boy, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. My We're going to find out. We're going to find out in the next day or two. My, my to make it fun, the production should get 170 millimeter mags and have like 27 yes. rounds. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be kind of fun. No, no, no limit, but must be concealed. You'll just see a guy. Like, <laughs> so guys Is that a magazine like, in your pocket? Or you just have to see me. And then require oh, it to yes. be a concealed division. There you go. Guys that, that look like literally they have a third arm around their waistline sticking straight out to the side when they have a <laughs> shirt over it. I I don't know. I, I kind of think that it's it's hard to know on limited optics because there's when you, when you kind of like l listen to like all the socials, you think that limited optics is a done deal. And historically, anything that USPSA says we're going to we're um, proposing eventually becomes a division. Uh, production, I have no idea. I like selfishly, I'd like to see production have full. I, max. That's that's fine. Production goes to fifteen. I don't think anyone's going back. I don't. I no. I want. I want them to fill up the mags all all yeah, not all the 15, way. Not fifteen. Your capacity. Yeah. One hundred forty millimeters. Yeah. Well, I I would even say not even one hundred forty. I would just say. Whatever the factory length of the grip is, you get that much. Or just say whatever fits in the box and then make the box so that most guns 
cannot I think I think the box is still is still valid in terms of like creating a size because you you could go and yeah. pre, like presumably um, if I have a Glock like, 19 and put a Glock 17 magazine in it, if that's still legal in the box, then I'd be like, okay, that's fine. And yeah. that's the same as shooting a Glock 17 or having a Glock 27. I mean, a Glock 26 with a with a 17 round mag in it. You just make something that shape, and then there'll be some guns like the Canic who will fit in the box and will have 18 rounds, and some guns like the XDMs which will hold 18 or 19 rounds in it, and you just you just go yeah. play that game. I think fundamentally the biggest thing USPSA should do whether they're going to do it or not is they need to actually go back and steve you talked about this but they need to actually establish some kind of a metric you know this is this officially is our go no go gauge on whether we do something and here's how we're going to define it here's here's the success rate or here's the success uh conditions here's the failure conditions if it doesn't meet the failure conditions then we have two options we can modify the division to see if there was something that we left out, carry optics, for example, it was 10 rounds and then it went to 140 millimeter. Or at that point we say, okay, well, the market says we don't want, we don't actually want it despite what everybody thought they said, and we're not gonna do it. I don't I don't know if USPSA do that. I really don't. I, I'd like to see it, but I think I think it's actually a good method to actually determine whether you should do something. Well, the, the one thing is I think there's far more incentive in the idea of sponsorships and everything else than if it would move – if you have members move from one division to another division, USPSA does not see any financial benefit out of that. So at that point, the financial benefit becomes ad revenue uh, through other sponsors. Um, so – that's yeah, but that's the problem, though, is ad, re ad revenue and sponsorship is fickle at best because you'll have people that'll – companies that will put money into supporting nationals, yeah, and they'll do it for a number of years, and then they'll be like, well, what did we actually get out of this? Well, not much. Well, hold, yeah, they can give you not much, but if someone cuts a $25,000 check, that's still worth you know, basically 1,000 members paying the, uh, the I don't want the magazine club card. It's like yeah. when you get a check for – Twenty five thousand dollars. I mean, that's that's equivalent probably to eight thousand members, or at least six thousand members signing up in one day at one go. So there is there is the incentive to there is the incentive to do it. It's 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 not running the organization is not free. It's just we just have a, a problem when it starts affecting the divisions uh, and the competition that we are shooting. Kenny, what do you think is coming out of the board meeting? I mean, if I had to guess, I would assume limited optics is happening. Yeah. Other than that, I have no idea. I mean, I, I'm sure production will, I'm sure, will change. What it changes to, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. do you think, Steve? I have no idea. No clue. Other than, like Kenny said, limited optics, I, I guess that that's going to be a provisional division. I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any reasoning to think that. It I'm about, like, I know this sounds stupid, but I'm more curious. Uh, in the inboard meeting, is this also where they were talking about all the rule changes too, about how many rounds you could have strong on a weekend in a stage, stuff like that? They, yeah, they certainly would be talking about that. I'm yeah, more they, curious about that stuff than the division changes. Yeah. If you're going to let me shoot a whole stage, strong hand weekend only, this boy's building stages at Slipside again. Well, what, was, what was that <laughs> stage? What was it from? I can't remember, but Niels Jonasson posted one of it where, where basically he ran the entire stage strong hand, then had to reload and then run the entire stage backwards again, weekend only. That was probably an IPSC stage because yeah. that's not legal in USPSA right now. Yeah. And so I was just like, why can't we do that? Yeah, that I've always saw that in IPSC and thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. All the all the little ticky tacky restrictions like you can't do this unless this and you can't do this unless this. I think. 90% of those should be wiped out. Well, and, yeah. Uh, That's what I'm more excited to hear about those than the division changes right now. Well, especially ones that have really nothing to do except for the, it kind of hurts us in the fields to do this. I, I would give anything to see them get rid of the tie, that tie-down strap rule. It's the dumbest rule that doesn't make any sense anymore. And the fact that I have to tell new shooters at every single match that they can't use that strap tells you that there's that the market has gone in a direction and uspsa needs to stop legislating that you one. can't use that strap with a single action revolver 
that's to Steve. That is literally how we should write it. That's literally how we should write it. Cause there's that's another, the only other can't purpose. This, but this, the super complicated rule. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question from Dirk Hopkins is, is a uh, CRO worth having? I don't really work matches out of town. Who's a CRO? I don't know. Robert, Robert, you're probably the only one that can actually answer this. Is anybody else a CRO here? Uh, Steven. Oh, Steve is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more, you get a, another day of training. You learn more at the second class. Um, I don't know. It's kind of nice to have. Do you need it? Probably not. Uh, it, it kind of depends. I think it depends on your goals, really. I mean, like, what is it you want to do? Because if if you go and take the RO class, that I I think everybody should be should be. I was going to say required, but I hate forcing people to do things. It should be heavily incentivized to take the RO class because you learn so much about the rules that you otherwise would be learning at that proverbial three seconds at a time kind of. Right. Once thing. you're like a C class. You should go take the, you should go become an RO. Yeah. But the CRO class, there's, there's a lot of stage stuff that they, that they talk about. The rules aren't really as big of a thing. You're debugging, um, problems. Uh, it allows you to work as the, the chief range officer at a major match, which doesn't really mean much, honestly. Um, I can't, I, I think if it's something that you want to do and it, and you feel a calling to do, then you should go get your CRO because it does help you to just to be that much more invested in the game. But I can't say that it's one of those things that people like, I can say everybody should take the RO class, should take the RO class. Even if you never take the test, go take the RO class. I can't really say that the CRO class is something that's just going to give you a tremendous amount of return on value beyond but Dirk, personal satisfaction. You, right. And but Dirk does create stages and he does run matches and he does I mean it'll just be some more training on debugging and things. Yeah. Things and, of that nature. Yeah, and in Dirk's case, um he's learned all he's learned a lot of those debugging um things right. because he's been such a great stage designer um for so long and he learned it by being I mean not a bad stage designer but he went through all the what do you call it the quirks and the the nuances that new stage designers go through so he's really really a great stage designer except for when he brings barrels barrels suck those are the best stages shut your whore mouth <laughs> bring all the barrels should be like donkey kong over here yeah uh from sebastian muñoz are dots on carry guns the norm already what's yes. the best carry dot that's very I, good. it's very hard to say well, it's 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 not it's not hard to say. I mean, like they they got they got to stand up to being like walking into a door, walking into a shopping cart. They can't have something that's re, that's really going to shatter. And a lot of the competition optics um, just aren't braced up around the sides. If you take a look at something like the Romeo One or the Delta Point has the shroud um, or the SRO, there, there's not a lot there to take a substantial knock. Now they're still yeah. not. They're, they're still pretty tough. The other part is, too, it's like the uh, – back in the day, you used to be able to say get an RMR or a Hollow Sun 507 or something like that. But the other thing is now is that there's other options on the market that allow you to have an enclosed optic, uh, an enclosed emitter because um, when you – lots of things aren't in, in your control. And you bring up something when it's rainy, uh, it's wet, something like that, like you can start having funky things happen to your dot. And so, but the other problem is too is the other drawback on something like an RMR is very small and it conceals pretty well. And then you get something like a Aimpoint Acro, which is a mailbox, and you put that on top of your slide, and then your gun's profile is a little bit bigger. And so, it, it's kind of one of those things. I, I would say if you're holding like a Glock 19 gun, then hey, go go get a dot on it. But a lot of the smaller guns, like the Glock 26s and stuff like that, that are like uh, appendix or like pocket carry. Uh, you still don't need a, a dot for that right. kind of work. Um, but yeah, those those enclosed emitters, I would, I I would take a um, six MOA dot over a small dot, but I would take a decently sized structured window with a small dot over yeah. a small window, big dot. Um, I really like my RMR six MOA. 
I think that's a that's a great dot and it has a great battery life on it. Um, and but the one thing you got to look for is is somewhat durable, uh, a, a dot that you can deal with, and battery life. Any of this auto on or, or adjustability, none of that stuff works very well. So you just want something that's like I can turn it on to one setting below max and leave it there for a year, and when it's my birthday, I change the batteries. So my son-in-law, Curtis Hutchinson, did a bunch of research, and he kind of came down to that Holosun 509T, yep. kind of a fully enclosed box. Yep. I don't know the exact model number, maybe the HE 509T RDX2 or something like that, yep. but I think Jared mentioned that one last yeah. show, a couple shows ago, the 509TX2. Every, every, Brian, duty, everyone, duty or carry. everyone who I know has a 509 likes them. I mean, they have a 2MOA dot, and they have the, that little donut of death you can take on and off. Um, yeah, and those are, those are fantastic setups that you can have. Um, when we look through them, when you like look through something like an SRO or a Delta Point Pro and then look through that, you're like, I don't, I don't know if I – like I could shoot somebody if I had to, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, and you, you have something like that or like a Seymour – but then you get an optic like that, and they they are pretty good. Uh, that that five hundred nine setup is the way it is, but it is a larger setup. And the other big part old is, box. And some of us, some of us are are shooting, you know, for concealed carry Smith and Wesson M uh, P shields, like the the what is it? What's the super size? The super carry shield there with all the bullets. The shield plus. Shield plus can can put a five hundred nine on that. Yeah, I'm yeah. still trying to find an optic for my LCP-22. Yeah. I, so like, really struggling. So would you say the standard for concealed carry is not quite yet to dots? Like, or, or the standard is somewhere in between? I would I would say it's 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 definitely 50-50 now because if I go out on the range and I go see people, a lot of them have dots on their guns. But once, hmm. they, once they drop below that Glock 19 size, the dots kind of go away. But it's also... I mean, guys are carrying P365s, which are that smaller set of guns, and they have their Romeo Zeros or 507Ks on them or RMRCs. They can they can kind of put on guns that size. So it's definitely it's a mixed bag for sure. I, I would say once you get down to the super small windows on the super small guns, it makes those guns a little bit easier to shoot at distance like dots always do. Um, but, like, those windows are tiny. Like you think an RMR window is kind of tiny or a 507 window is tiny. Like these, those Romeo Zeros and stuff, like those are very tiny windows and they have like three MOA dots. And, you know, a lot of them nowadays are being made out of plastic with plastic screens on them. So Jeez. you can do do what you wish with that. But I would say RMR or 509, you're, you're pretty much set. So. Yeah, it's hard. Like all of my carry guns right now, they're still all iron sided guns and it's just, it's hard. It's hard because they just work and I've never had a problem with them. And I, I'm like my, my most preferred carry gun of all time is the PO seven. And, um, it's, it's the double single. Everything's bone stock. I conceivably it's a Glock 19 size. I could put an optic on it and probably be okay, but I, I just don't, I don't feel like I need to yet. Maybe maybe someday down the road, but right now that gun is stupid accurate. I can hit everything I want to hit, and I don't feel disadvantaged by it yet. I mean, Plus, I I have the advantage that um, I can go into any room with any lighting condition pretty much, and still be able to actually see what I'm aiming at, as opposed to the dots, which if you get like a a flashlight effect on it, you're gonna blow out that which can sometimes be a problem until you get the adjustment to work, which is what you're talking about. Well, that's, and that's why you just never, you don't even get the adjustment. You just take the dot on and I mean, you just have the dot set to full bloom, full bloom, max mm. brightness. And when I look through it about something, uh, Hey, it's really easy to pick up and I fire on the light, then it becomes a perfect little dot. But the one right. thing is too, it's like go out and go shoot your comp gun. Then take your, take your concealed carry gun out and try to do the same thing. And then when you put a dot on that, it feels like like, oh, it's just like a little bit smaller. But when you when you have that kind of setup where you go from dot shooting twenty yard shots, and then you go to your iron sight gun and shoot twenty yard shots, you're like, I can do this. I know how to do this with irons, but this is a lot easier with the dots. And especially when you have something like the hollow sun, like uh, the small hollow suns that mount directly to the MOS plates, 
that are right in line with your irons, except for it's just giving you a temp to MOA dot with that same uh, presentation. It's yeah, get, it's getting hard to uh, not to do it. I think the I think the world is moving, and I think dots are just they're just going to become a come a thing, and iron sights are eventually eventually going to be like the blunderbuss. Yo, yeah, it was really cool back in its time, but it's 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 done. I would, and I would, I am always will be the advocate of still have the iron sights, not because of malfunctions, because you're going to lean up against something and that dot's going to get dimmed, or it's going to run out of batteries, and instead of you doing the, oh no, what happened, you just start shooting the damn iron sights. Iron sights, I, because you are not perfect. Well, I, and that... There, there's a certain degree of truth to that, but it speaks to your age and experiences more than anything. Well, where you you have grown up in this age of perfect reliability of an iron sight, and you now have this new technology, but you're still one foot in the old world. And the people today, the young the younglings of today, they'll be like, no, why would you ever use anything but this? Because it's proven itself out. And they're going, they, as time goes on, are going to become more and more correct. And your opinion, while it has validity, is going to be less and less so. Well, the, right? the, well as dots get more and more reliable and lower yeah, cost. As, as, they get more, yeah. as they get more and more reliable and have better sensors and know exactly what you're trying to do with them at that moment, then, then that's fine. But listen, I, I have a spare magazine on me because I'm capable of missing shots and I'm capable of effing up reloads and I'm capable of doing all sorts of stupid stuff. So, you know, for uh, 8% of my window, I will gladly have the option to, to transfer to something else when I just can't do anything with the dot because my dumb ass did something. No, I, 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 I totally get it, Tommy. I mean, it's like people, like, I remember when Andrew and I first got married, we had a landline and we had cell phones. Because, you know, you have to have a landline. Why do? Why would you ever have a house that doesn't have a landline? And then eventually, you know, three or four years later, like, why do we still have a landline? Or Tom, and now today or people or are like, why shadows. would you, ever... you know? Tell the <laughs> truth, Tom. You carry a spare magazine because your crotch rig came with a spot for one. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to buy the spot. I didn't have to buy the spot. I oh. just, I just, I like the idea of having, a, you know, 46 rounds, 47 rounds on the go. So it's uh, Tom, Tom I, I understand that, that he was attacking. You had to shoot him. But why did you reload? Got to be topped off for the next guy. <laughs> that's that's it. All right. Well, thanks for downloading, listening, and subscribing. We appreciate you guys doing all that. Um, yeah, we love you guys. Thanks for doing that. Uh, you can check out the video version on YouTube. Just search uh, para, Paracast Firearms Podcast. It should pop right up. You'll see all our mugs on there, and you can see what we're actually talking about. So for Steve Koski, Robert Wyatt, on, and Kenny Terry, I'm Tom Nelson, bidding you peace, love, and soul as we depart into the open waters of the Sea of Life on a little tugboat we like to call the Paracast. Hasta la vista, baby. Good night, everybody. Toot toot.